Well, I feel under no pressure at all. <laughs> My, um, the title, well, the only title that I could possibly come up with is What Happens When a Church Really Prays? Every year in January, the very first week of January, this church starts with a whole week of prayer. So all the services are suspended. And in that time when the services would be, we gather together and we pray together. And this year's theme or vision for this year was a year of hiring. And when we came to pray, we did it so much different. It was so challenging. It was so exciting. And it was a real encouragement to me this time to hear so many different voices raised in prayer and really seeking after the Lord. But I don't know about you, if I'm being really honest, I think that prayer is my biggest deficiency. Sometimes it's the hardest thing for us to do. But I know that it's one of the most important factors of my Christian walk is where my relationship is really built on the Lord. And so I want to encourage you this morning by looking at a passage that really encourages us to see what happens when a church really plays, prays. Now there are lots of cliches, I'm sure you've heard them all, um, but here's one that you've probably seen and probably someone has said it to you at some point in the past and that is prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. You can get it on car stickers, bookmarks, you name it. And that wonderful person, when you're down in the hole, has come up to you and said, prayer changes things, and you want to punch them in the nose and say, thank you for that really helpful bit of information. But you know, it is true. Prayer does change things. It doesn't mean that you always get what you want. Neither does it mean that you can turn the Lord around to your way of thinking. It doesn't mean that things will work out how you wanted them to be. But prayer does change things. Not only does it change things, it changes people. Possibly the person that you're praying for but most likely, it's you that is going to be changed as you pray for someone else or for something else. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes people. But prayer changes churches. Things really happen when churches pray. So my first question to you this morning is, what do you want? What do you want to see in this church. I can tell you what I want to see. I want to see us grow, not necessarily numerically, but in our passion and in our desire for the Lord. I want to see people getting saved. I want there to be a baptismal service every single week. I want to see an Acts 2, 2 church alive and kicking in this place. Many amazing things will happen if God's people will pray. Throughout the book of Acts, we read of the amazing power that was experienced by the early church. Throughout church history, men and women of God have experienced great power. Many of you can testify to the glory days of this church or the churches where you've been at and where you can speak of the wonderful power that you've seen in those places. But this is my question. Why do we always talk about it in the past tense? Why is it always backwards that we're looking back and saying, well, this is how great it was. This is how good it was. What's happened? Where is it now? Is it that the Lord has changed? Well, not according to Malachi 3.6, because it says in there, for I am the Lord and I change not. So we either believe the word or we don't. So the Lord hasn't changed. Is it because we live in a really wicked society? Well, if you looked at Elijah 
And he, he experienced the power of God during the reign of King Ahab. I'm not sure that our society really fits in with that. So what's stopping us? Is it government oppression? Peter, James and John had to deal with persecution from the leaders of their day. And yet we read that the Lord added daily to the church. Is it the sermons? They're all from scripture. Is it the worship? It's all from our heart. I believe the answer to the problem is summed up in one word, prayer. I'm talking about the people of God humbly bowing before him and crying out to him with a passion. So many are focused on the hype and the traditions that we can remember from our childhood instead of crying out for his power and his presence in the church today. We don't need old-time religion. I don't want old-time religion. I don't want something that my parents or my grandparents experienced. I want a move of God now that I can experience. I want the power that Paul and Silas experienced in the middle of the jail when they prayed and they sang, probably out of tune, and an earthquake shook the foundations of the prison and broke the chains that bound them. I want the power that Stephen possessed as he was stoned to death for the testimony of the Lord, as he stood with death approaching him, and he could say, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I want the power that sustained James as Herod had him beheaded. I want the power that the church experienced right here in Acts chapter 12 which is where I'm going to be reading from, as they fervently prayed for the release of Peter. So this morning, I'd like to share with you that very subject and ask the question, what happens when churches pray? Or what if my people pray? So I'm reading from Acts chapter 12, and it says this. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And on the very night, when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and aroused him, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he didn't know that what was being done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate which leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and immediately along one street. And immediately the the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent me his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant named Rhoda came to to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, She did not open the gate. I always want to start to laugh at this point. But ran in and announced that Peter was standing in the front of the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren, and he departed and went to another place. 
Now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. I bet there wasn't. And when Herod had searched for him and had not found him, they examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. That sounds like a lovely ending. The first verse says, it was about this time, or now about that time. Which always leads me to the question, what time? What time? Well, the events are leading up to chapter 12. You've got Stephen being martyred. You've got great persecution breaking out. Believers are scattered all over. This horrible person called Saul is wandering around trying to round up as many Christians as he can to throw them into prison, feed them to the lions, whatever he's doing. And then all of a sudden, he's radically changed. And these Christians, because I can imagine, oh, Lord, you've got to deal with Saul, you've got to deal with Saul. And when the Lord answers how he answers and does deal with Saul... I put, that weren't what I meant, really. He's been going around killing everybody and what? What? The Gentiles are also being saved and they are being filled with the Holy Spirit. But they're praying. They have a reason. So what is the reason that the church have gathered together to pray? Well, it's happened during the Festival of Unleavened Bread. James, one of the disciples, has already been arrested and been beheaded by Herod. James' death, we've already read, pleased the Jews. And now Peter is imprisoned and possibly facing the same fate. The Jews hated the gospel with a passion. And the fact that Christians and the church were spreading it and propagating it was enough. The persecution that Herod showed and brought him great political advantage. Herod was demonstrating the fate of all those people who chose the gospel. The plan to destroy the church while it was in its infancy. So, what are the reasons that we have to pray? We could say that they had a real proper reason to come together to pray do we not have any reason to come together to pray are there no problems in our churches today satan's goal is still to destroy the church and when we look around we could say that he's doing a pretty good job there are many other religions and false religions that are doing really well and are springing up all over. I would say that there is no shortage of reasons for the church to pray today. Now Herod wanted to be sure that Peter stayed in prison. Now I don't know if you've noticed, but the Romans really knew how to build proper buildings because a lot of them are still standing today. So if you imagine Peter in the middle of a very strong fortress, not only that, Herod assigns four squads of soldiers to guard Peter and to make sure that he's not going anywhere. I think that's a little bit of overkill myself, but there we have it. And we see later that actually two of them are even chained, one on his left, one on his right, to Peter. There is no way he's going anywhere out of there without someone knowing about it. So we've got the reason why the church were praying. They were gathered together because their leader had been arrested 
and they were coming to pray for Peter's release. There is a responsibility in prayer. It was a dark time. One of their leaders potentially facing death. But there's an important word in verse 5. Verse 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. Do you know what the important word is? But. But. Peter was kept in prison. But. But what? But prayer. We read that prayer was made without ceasing. Peter was released. And when he was released, when he went to the house, they were still praying. But let me share three things about our responsibility in prayer. Our prayers must be intentional. This church had one goal and one goal only. They wanted to see Peter released. They didn't gather to go over a list of needs and wants. They saw Peter's release from his chains. That was the driving force that they wanted. And prayer was made to God for him. This church was focused. If you look at verse 12, Peter came to the house of Mary, mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered there praying. The entire church was gathered together to fervently pray for one of their own. It's not enough for us simply to make a speech to God. We have to pray intentional prayers. We have the opportunity to boldly go before the throne on behalf of one another. And our prayers must be intense. This prayer was a fervent prayer. Fervent means intent without ceasing. It carries the idea of praying with an urgency. It's a type of praying that the church needs today. James says the effect, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Our prayers must be intimate. The early church joined together to seek help for their brother. I'm sure that Jamie would really appreciate it if you did the same. The beauty of this prayer is the intimacy and the unity of the church. They were together in one accord, bowing humbly before the Lord and making their requests known. They were individuals coming together as a body. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Peanuts cartoons that have Lucy, usually, and Linus, who's a little guy with a comfort blanket, bless him. Peanuts, that's the one. And he's got a, a little comfort blanket and he's a little bit of a softy. What else can you say, really? Well, in this particular one, Lucy demands that Linus changes the television channel. And she threatens him with her fist if he didn't. What makes you think you can walk in here and take over, he says. Lucy says, these five fingers. Individually, they may not look like much. But when they come together as one unit... They form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want, says Linus. <laughs> and then he turns away and he looks at his fingers and he says, why can't you guys get organised like that? That is the thing, you see. As individuals, we may seem weak and the enemy can actually pick us off one by one. But when we come together as one solid unit, with one accord, with the same focus, the same purpose, we become a weapon that is something to behold. They offered their prayers and God heard them and moved in great power. 
Many times through Paul's writing, we read where he tells the church that he's praying for them. And we also read on many occasions where he asks them to pray for him. It's our responsibility to pray for one another. So we have a reason for it. We have the responsibility in it. And now let's come to the exciting bit, the result of it. While the church is gathered praying, Peter's in prison between two soldiers in chains, sound asleep. Now that actually blows my mind. He's been arrested. He's got the potential of the day after to be beheaded, exactly the same as James. Is he panicking and stressing and worrying about it? No. He is sound asleep. And that speaks to me so much of the peace of God in the middle of your circumstances. That's the kind of peace that Noah had when the rain started to fall. It's the kind of peace that Daniel had in the lion's den. It's the kind of peace that the three Hebrew young lads had in the fiery furnace. It's the kind of peace that you can have when troubles come your way as a child of God. Peter knew that the Lord was in control. What's the worst thing that could happen to him? He had his head chopped off and he went to meet the Saviour. Win-win. Meanwhile, back in the church, they're still praying. What if my people pray? Prayers will be answered. This is the other bit that I find quite amusing. The angel of the Lord appeared before Peter and gives him, because he's that sound asleep, a sharp dig in the ribs. Ow! Thanks. Come on, he says, get up and get dressed. Don't you think that's amazing in itself? Not the angel bit, not the angel bit, but the fact that Peter had kicked off his shoes and his cloak and made himself at home in the prison cell, chained between these two guys and thought, it's time for sleep now. But then again, do you think the soldiers were asleep or awake? Suddenly, a bright light appears in the cell. Can you sleep through bright light? A light would surely wake you up, wouldn't it? The angel, it says, is talking, not whispering. Come on, Peter, it's time to get up. Get your shoes on, get your coat on. We're going to sneak out of here. He says the angel was talking. The chains fell off Peter's wrists. Ooh, they were made of rubber, so they didn't make a noise as they bounced on the floor. No, they probably made a, quite a big clattering noise, big heavy chains falling off. How long did it take Peter to get dressed? Who knows? I assumed that they passed through lots of doors and lots of gates, and I bet you there was no WD-40 on any single one of those hinges. They would hear every single creak and groan. You see, you might be facing a situation that seems impossible. The answer, pray. There may be times when you don't feel like praying. The answer, pray. There may be times when you don't feel like you are getting through. The answer, keep praying. When prayers are answered, people will be amazed. People are amazed at answered prayer. The enemy is amazed. The person about whom you're praying may be amazed. And those who are praying... The prayer will be amazed. And that is exactly what happened here. Verses 9 to 11. Here's the amazing thing. The operation is so secret that Peter doesn't even know it's really happening. Sometimes we can't see God working even when it's ridiculously obvious. Can you believe that at first Peter didn't even know what was going on? This was a man who had witnessed many miracles a man who walked on water, a man who preached at Pentecost, a man who performed several miracles himself. Now, okay, we can say maybe Peter's confusion was the fact that he'd been in a deep, deep sleep. He may have thought he was dreaming. But when he did come to himself and he realised, hang on, this is real. The Lord has brought me out here. Now we come 
to one of the most entertaining and comical portions of scripture, it fires up my imagination no end. Peter goes to John Mark's mum's house. This is where the church have gathered to pray. And he's banging away on the gate. And a young girl comes to the door, Rhoda. She heard his voice. Oh, it's Peter. And she's so excited. She don't let him in. She runs back into the rest of the team where they're all there praying, shouting at the top of the voice, Peter's at the gate, Peter's at the gate, Peter's at the gate. And they'll go, sit down, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. So while the argument's going on, no, Peter's at the gate. No, he's not. Peter's at the gate. No, he's not. Peter's at the gate. Well, maybe it's an angel. Peter is still stood at the gate, banging on the gate for dear life. Probably got cut knuckles 35 minutes later. You see, God could get Peter out of the prison but Peter couldn't get himself into the prayer meeting. I find that really funny. But when they got up and they saw Peter, they were astonished. But I can just picture Rhoda's face. It's those lines, isn't it, that you dread someone saying to you, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. Well, when they finally got up and they saw Peter, they were astonished. Peter told them everything that had happened because of their faithfulness in prayer. And even so... They were absolutely blown away. Isn't that so true of us, really? We're praying for something, and we can get an answer right before our eyes, and we kind of go, I don't believe that. But it's the thing that you've been praying for, that you've earnestly been seeking. And now when it's here, you kind of have to pinch yourself 26 times and make yourself black and blue all over so that you can really prove that it is happening. How many times... Do we call on the Lord to move in a mighty way? And when he does, we just can't seem to grasp the fact that he's heard our prayer. Too many times we attempt to explain away the miracles in our lives. We give coincidence far more credit than we do to the Lord. But our God works in wonderful ways. And we will be amazed by his power in answered prayer. We shouldn't only be amazed, but we should be humbled at the fact that we can go before the throne and make our requests to Almighty God and that he, in his love and in his mercy, will hear our prayers and move heaven and earth for us. When prayers are answered, the people of God will be amazed. The enemies of God will be amazed too. Verse 18, at daybreak, the soldiers knew they were going to have one very bad day. One soldier chained to Peter on the left. One soldier chained to Peter on the right. They woke up and no Peter. Oops. They woke up and they were amazed at the fact that Peter had gone. I can picture them looking around, scratching their head, thinking, what on earth? What in the world has just happened here? Where did he go? How did this happen? What are we going to do? There would probably be a great deal of fear because they would be held responsible. Do you remember the jailer who, when Paul and Silas were singing and the earthquake happened and the doors blew open, he was about to kill himself with his sword because he thought that the prisoners had gone. When the power of God moves in your life, your enemies will be amazed. We have the account of the showdown on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. They cried out to their false gods all day long to no avail. Elijah prayed a short, simple, but powerful prayer. And God poured down fire from heaven. You better believe that in the short period between that prayer and the prophets of Baal death, they were amazed at that answered prayer. People may look at you and think you're wasting your time when you cry out to God. But if you remain steadfast 
and faithful to the Lord, your enemies will be amazed at what God can and will do in your life. When his people pray, prayers will be answered. People will be amazed. But we also will see that power will appear. We've already seen great power in Peter's release from prison. But we read even more. Our adversary may come against the church. He may come against our brothers and sisters. What can, what should we do? Pray without ceasing. There may be troubles that come, but we need to remember who is in control. Do you want the power the early church possessed? Are you willing to join together and cry out to God for your brothers and sisters? Do you have a burden for the lost? Do you have a passion for the saved to grow deeper in their relationship with the Lord? Look what can happen when people pray. For 31 years, Spurgeon filled the pulpit at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He preached twice on a Sunday and hundreds and hundreds of people came to a saving knowledge of Jesus each year and were baptised. What was it that gave this church its power? Well, on Sunday, five young students who were preparing to go into the ministry visited to hear Spurgeon preach. While waiting for the doors to open, Charles Spurgeon approached them and asked if they would like to see the powerhouse of the church. Of course, the young students were delighted at the opportunity to see the secret power. Spurgeon led them through a long hallway, down a stairway, and cautiously opened the door at the bottom. What the five young men saw was 700 church members bowed in prayer, asking God for his blessing on the upcoming service. Some of us struggle to be here for half past 10 and yet these people 700 of them were already in the building praying for the service before it started things started to happen when Christians pray miraculous things happen when we pray great things happen the supernatural happens Do we all believe that, that great things will happen, can happen, should happen when churches really pray? God is still the same. On a personal level, how's your prayer life? Do you rush to work without saying anything to the Lord? Do you rush a prayer that you would never rush if you were talking to someone in person, talking to a friend? In your individual life, where is prayer? How can people get saved if they're not here to listen to the message? Do you pray for those who need to hear the gospel? Where is prayer in your life? We've heard from the word of God what can happen when a church prays. When it comes together in one accord, corporately to pray. Are we willing to do that or would we rather leave it to others to those who we think are better at it than we are to those who we think have that ministry gift the prayer meeting after all is another night in the week and I already come to so many do we have a consciousness and an awareness that the Lord is here do we come in awe and reverence of who he is, knowing that he is here and that he is willing and able to hear our prayers. Acts 4 verse 31 is another record of the early church. And it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and all were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Well, those kind of things don't happen anymore, do they? When people come together in one accord and pray, the Holy Ghost doesn't fall anymore. It doesn't happen like that. 
does it not? In looking around, I discovered in 1940, on the Isle of Lewis, towards the end of a prayer meeting, one of the local blacksmiths were asked to pray. And he turned his prayers towards the promises of God and towards his own thirst for God. And he finished with these words, O oh God, your honour is at stake. Fulfil your covenant engagement and do what you have promised to do. And at that moment, the house shook. And as the people continued in prayer and then left that prayer meeting at five o'clock in the morning, they went out onto the streets of that small town on the Isle of Lewis and realised that the whole community had been changed and made aware of God's presence. It can happen. It does happen. So why can't it happen here? Are we aware of the surprising things that happen? That at the end of this week, maybe even during the week, or even today, an answer to our church prayers may come if we really get down to prayer. Obstacles that we think are immovable, eternal, can be dissolved before our very eyes, melted before the power of God in answer to prayer. Are we more worried about what each other thinks of us than what Almighty God thinks about our prayers? God gives us more authority on our knees than we could ever care to ask for. More things are wrought in prayer than this world ever dreams of. What have you dreamed of? What are your dreams? What are your visions? If it's according to the will of God and rooted in his promises, it can be yours for the asking in prayer. Maybe you're here today and you've not accepted Jesus as your saviour and you've got no idea what I'm talking about. Maybe though, like most people, you may have shot up a random prayer at some point in your life in the hope that someone, something, somewhere out there would hear it. Maybe the Lord in his mercy has actually answered that prayer. But his goodness to you hasn't brought you to that place of repentance. Well, let me tell you this morning that there is a whole life of answered prayer waiting ahead of you, if you will only trust him. Maybe you are here and you haven't accepted Jesus as your saviour because he's never answered a single one of your prayers. So he can't be real. And that's what you're holding against him. But it could be that there's a greater prayer than the prayer that you need to pray. And that prayer is the starting point. It's a prayer of repentance. And so my challenge to you is, can you pray that today? For those of us who know Jesus as our saviour, what's your prayer life like? Does it need an MOT? Do you need a refreshing? Do you need an awareness and a consciousness of the presence of Almighty God that you've never known before? Can we as a fellowship unite together in prayer to see great things done because we have really prayed. Your honour is at stake, Lord. This is the prayer of my heart. I hope it's the first of many that is answered for his namesake. Amen.